go into that 19th century in the United States, an example of thinking. Martin Delaney, a great Jamaican, Robert Campbell, who went out to Nigeria, Abakuta, to search for a place with Martin Delaney. You dare to look at the work of our, the non-fiction work of the first black novelist, William Wells Brown, the female anti-slavery speakers, Elaine Watkins, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner True. You dare to look at the finest single mind produced in the United States by black Americans in the 19th century, Frederick Douglass. A look at his conflict with Ruswam and others over whether to settle in Liberia or not to settle. Douglas took a principal position that was right, and his opposition was also right. Too many times you've been trained by the movies to look for the good guy and the bad guy in the drama. When sometimes you got dramas with all bad guys. You got dramas with all good guys. You don't necessarily have to have a bad guy. Douglas was not a bad guy because he opposed the African migration movement. He said that we had earned our right to stay in this country with our blood and our sweat and our death. And he was right. Delaney and others, Campbell, Ruswan, said that the opening up of Liberia, the settlement of Liberia, gives us an opportunity to prove to the world we once ruled great states and could do it again. And they were right. So we're not dealing with right or wrong here. We deal with two rights in conflict. And your American movie mind won't let you deal with two rights in conflict because you still haven't dealt with the two rights in conflict in relationship to W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington where both of them were right then, both of them were right now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We did not need to devise that Booker T. Washington or W.E.B. Du Bois. We needed Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Both of them had something to contribute to our own salvation as a people. Then you need to look at the end of that 19th century when Africans began to send forth great thinkers. You need to look at the life of Edmund Blyton and look at his inaugural address on liberal education, Liberia College, 1881. And look at the Caribbeans Thinkers, Blyden, others that followed Blyden. Blyden was from the Danish West Indies at the, at the time. And understand that great thinking, great challenges, opening up questions, not new to us. All right, gentlemen. Welcome back to Breakdown Friday. Joseph Ward, Professor Carl Tone Jones, Patrick Irvin. We are here back on, on the shoulders of giants. If this is your first time being here, welcome. I appreciate you tuning in and I hope you enjoy what you hear. All my returning viewers, I appreciate you all. I love you all. So let's get into it. You see the, the clip from Dr. John Henry Clark. Basically getting down to... Uh, one of the things, uh, a conversation Pat PC and I have had for years, um, Pat phrases it, phrases it as two things can be true at the same time. Um, and that's one of the uh, main points Dr. Clark is getting at um, 
we always seem to end up in conflict or debate because people have um opposite ideas or somebody somebody may disagree with somebody else but it always leads to conflict and debate but before we get into that he also he started talking about great uh african thinkers and he ended talking about great african thinkers so that's the point where i want to start about our thinkers so thinkers are needed black thinkers are needed but in 2023 I believe, and we've had conversations, but I've put it on me. I believe that the role of the thinker has changed a bit because our situation is a lot more dire than it was in the past. So I want to start with you, Pat. Um, thinkers are needed, but in your opinion, has the role of the thinker changed? Can thinkers only just be thinkers in 2023, or do we need more from our thinkers and our intellectuals in 2023? Um, I don't. So, yes, I do think thinkers are needed. I don't think the time period is what has changed what's required of our thinkers. I think it's the society we live in, the, 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 the structures we have in place. All societies, regardless of where you are in the power structure, uh when you're in your infancy and you don't control anything you like you don't have set up systems established around you to support your thinking you have to do more than think uh, that's what comes with building that process you go back into american history you start thinking about your benjamin franklins and all of those people um who are known as great thinkers and doers they had to be because there was no system built up to support just thinking then as things got put in place you start seeing the the segmentation or the stratification of society where you start seeing uh the thinkers being supported by doers so now they can the think tanks don't need cat tank uh cat programs no more community action programs no more they can sit back and come up with plans because there's a group of doers that's going to execute those plans but before you get to that point you you have to do other things besides think i think the black community it doesn't matter the time period um that to me is another one of those we're modeling our surroundings without understanding why our surroundings work the way they work white people and other groups that are have more systems and things in place institutions in place they can afford to have their extremely intelligent people sit in a room read books and create theory because there's an entire structure surrounding them that's going to transfer those theories into practical applications that they can then analyze to refine those theories so i think the role of the thinker in the black community has just been poorly defined all the way up until i think uh chancellor williams really was the first author i saw well Harold Cruz in a little bit with the crisis of the Negro intellectual written in the 60s. But Chancellor Williams was the first person I read directly speak to the fact that black thinkers need to do more than just think and theorize. They need mm -hmm. to get out there and get involved um, and, 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 and show people as well. It's not just about creating a theory get out there and do it and he went so far as to even say you have to also present your thinking in a way that people consuming it don't have to think about it because of where he saw us as a community um the average black person mm -hmm. paraphrasing his estimation didn't have the time or the energy or the know-how to interpret things in a way that was beneficial for the collective right so when a black thinker presented information they had to present it in such a way that all of the necessary thinking was done for the average black person so they could just consume it and do something so we're not even doing that right 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 because you, you you have to get them to a point to where they can now begin to critically think 
right. and and the info. So because it, it's how you serve people, you learn how to serve people. Actually, serving people and being successful at serving people because there are groups of people who serve people, but I wouldn't necessarily call them successful because if you measure it as far as a a tangible outcome you will you won't see any so being able to learn how to properly serve people you know uh we all been through this but you know pat we've been through it with the with the community service and stuff that we've done in the past that have failed we we learned this by actually failing about how you actually serve people but that's the process of you know giving people information that's digestible giving giving people information in a way that is um, that they can they can actually uh, practically use it, but also coming out of the ivory towers, coming from behind the desk, taking the white coats off, all the intellectuals, taking taking the intellectual white coat off, getting into the community and connecting with the people that you are supposedly uh, are helping or doing the research for, because there has to be a connection. But like you say, we ha- we already have enough evidence to show that intellectuals or even any other people from successful realms when the community can't see you when the community can't interact with you you don't exist you're ineffective so so pc same thing to you thinkers um yes thinkers are needed but has the role of the thinker change and do you also think that thinkers need to come out of the ivory towers and get into the communities and get active and do more than just think uh kind of not mm-hmm. necessarily full blown cuz i think a lot of thinkers a lot of our thinkers are just too well known so mm-hmm. a lot of our thinkers become celebrities because they think and they speak on things they think of and it becomes something popular and and te- so the integrity of creating an idea and building on an idea gets lost in the perpetual, you know, adrenaline rush that comes from uh, one of my posts going viral. You know, something I'm thinking, and, and it's a viral moment, so it's being shared by everyone now. And I'm a celebrity in the spotlight to hit. Um, I think Patrick put up a put up a good example. Um, of the so-called founding fathers of this country, well, they are the founding fathers of this country. You know. Um, a lot of their thought leaders, and that's what this is. You know, we have thinkers, they're thought leaders. A lot of it was generating, you know, the at the turn of the 18th century when the American Revolution was fought. Prior to that, you had Thomas Paine writing, you know, his uh, periodicals and common sense. You had Benjamin Franklin, who also had a different pen name. But they were also feeding that revolutionary fervor, you know, something we speak about in the Independence Day project. They actually took it off the paper. And actually, they took it off the streets and they actually put it right here in Philadelphia in Independence Mall. And they all signed their name to a document called the, um, the Declaration of Independence. That was taking it off, you know, bringing them out into the public and actually, you know, putting them out in the field out of the ivory towers because they became um, known as terrorists and they were they became enemies of the state if they would have gotten caught they would have been drawn and quartered or you know uh executed for going up against the crown of uh britain at the time i think when i think about it i think about it in the perspective of a thought leader has to be a visionary and as and one thing you know and pat hit on several good points visionary has to present a clear picture to you i think one of the biggest issues in terms of liberation pushes or people who identify as liberators today is that they don't have a vision of what it looks like they only know to react and respond that was one of the purposes see and i, and I just want to take this around the world real quick and bring it back so it makes sense when I was one of, you know, I always say the children, black children, the futures of black children was the primary motivator for the Independence Day project. And one of the things I noticed 
was how children in Africa were going to junkyards and finding ways to power up their their villages. That you know, because a lot of this, there's a lot of communities in Africa without flowing power, flowing power grid. So they were finding out ways to to generate power, to generate light, to create lighting for four to six hours a day, which was huge in the village that had they didn't have access to it. I said to myself, because as a therapist, I had worked with white children out in the county of Philadelphia. I got to see how children who are not oppressed get to be creative. They get to think outside the box. They get to visualize themselves saving the day. Cowboys, Indians, uh, they, they, you know, some type of space pirate or whatever. But they get to have this fantasy because they lived in a world where they weren't oppressed. And, and oppression kills dreams. So when I created the Independence Day Project film, one of the things that I, I thought about, I want black children to have the freedom to be, you know, to, to be able to think outside the box. To not necessarily have to think, damn, we need lights for our village. Let's try to come up with a way to gain some solar power or to create a generator out of parts from the junkyard to, to, to generate electricity so that, you know, my little sister can read her book and get her schoolwork done. So that was the purpose behind it, is, is, is creating a vision of what black liberation looked like, to be a liberated people by utilizing a film that piece by piece breaks it down to you. So, and not, not, and I'm not using this as a shameless plug, but I'm trying to say is our thought leaders need this year, this day and age, need to be more than just charismatic leaders. Mm. They, need, they need to be visionaries, but not only visionaries. We need to be able to create not just thought leaders, but think tanks that I have the opportunity and uh, to, to operate in a way where they're actually breaking down systemically the issues of the community and the best practices at fixing what's wrong, improving on situations, improving on scholarship in school. So you have a school district that decide we're not gonna teach African-American studies this semester. Fine, we already had that in our contingency plan. So our plan was already to institute Saturday morning schools in which we provide breakfast, meals, education, physical fitness for our children. That's proactive thinking in a community and it's already gonna be funded because we already planned for this. Um, this, is, this is why I think that, um, and I'm going over my notes <laughs> because I think that once you create that clear vision, of what it looks like and once you have think tanks that operate in it then i think that puts us in a better position to to not necessarily get caught up and reacting to everything and in, in the demoralization of a people they have to see it in action as you as you said earlier yeah well to me it sounds like we're talking about an educated class with no structure and when you don't have structure, you're going to have chaos. And this chaos comes in, in the form of conflict and debate. This chaos comes in the form of, I think, I think you are out to sabotage me. I think you're out to get me resentment looking at somebody who looks like you as an enemy because their ideas are opposite of yours or they disagree with your idea. Um, but even, you know, I don't, I don't like the term thought leader, and that's just my issue, because it sounds sounds scammy. But that's just my issue, you know. I'm not saying it is. That's just my issue, and I, I can recognize that. But um, the thinkers, I th Pat said something, and but both of you, both of you said a version of it. Being able to have a class of people who are able to only think, only concentrate 
on thinking and like the think tank having a class of people who can only do that because there's a structure within a system that they exist in that allows them to do that they have the luxury to only be thinkers where i i just believe that our situation is such dire now that we need as many hands on deck as possible like as far as in the in, in the trenches doing tangible things yes we still need an intellectual class yes we need a class of thinkers we need think tanks but we need a system to support them so that they can just do that and that it don't look like we're at that point um how many you all can tell me how many think tanks would you say we like black think tanks that we have in america that you know of uh besides the <laughs> harvest institute i can't think of one and i'm not i won't even say that that one's like fully functional for the simple fact that like yeah they're doing think tank work but it's not so right it's not on scale with the white think tanks right right, right. There, there ain't there's where well, there's no community action on there you go yeah so there's and, no and environment and that's the one yeah. that dr claude anderson put together and how he was able to generate the information for powernomics and all his other great works um and you know and it's funny because i, I researched this uh, a few years ago and at the time, it was like about 125 uh, multi-million dollar think tanks in America alone. And uh, every major corporation has a think tank. And and I'm just talking about think tanks that actually identify as think tanks. Right. And I'm not talking about law firms. I'm not talking about lobbyists. It's, I'm not talking about any of those other groups. It's within these that. firms. It's within right. them. So, you know, we, we you know... <laughs> You know that Willie Lynch shit really, really pinned us down because we can't get along to save our lives. And even if our lives depend on it, we will die on the sword rather than, you know, and, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that not only did the separation, I mean, we came here separated as a people, different tribes um, that, you know, some of them were, were worn with each other for, you know, centuries and came to America and had to be, you know, shackled with each other and forced to, to operate under a foreign system that stripped them of all type of any other kind of native communication tech, uh, skills we might have had, spiritual systems and languages and so forth. And then when you have the fact that, okay, so black folk finally figured out that we need to get along enough to at least break the chains, then you had the Willie Lynch, you know, um, syndrome kick in. And what, what you see right now is a lot of black people have been so indoctrinated. I would say all of us have, um, ourselves included, to see black people through the lens of white people. So we, we, we all look at black people as inferior. We don't look, we walk in a room full of, of, of sharp, smart black people. And I've heard so many brothers and sisters say, I start to, you know, uh, when I walk into a room, I size everybody up. And I'm like, what's the point of sizing everybody up if one of the first things people say is leave your ego at the door? And people ain't leaving their ego at the door. People are taking their egos out like a big ass napkin and putting it on the table. Right. <laughs> but I, but I, I do think a lot of people are dealing with some intellectual dishonesty because we know about the tribalism that was going on in africa before the europeans showed up we don't have any proof to show of any unified sense of of all the different people all the different nations in africa with the with the unity and the mindset of we are <clears throat> we are one continent um because it seems like and i could be wrong but correct me if i'm wrong it seems like the Africans from the continent in mass from, from different countries, from different ethnicities, from different cultures. The Europeans were the first ones to kind of lump them all in and, and be able to look at them as one people rather than them looking at themselves like that. Well, so, you know, ahead. racial identity wasn't created until the 1600s. 
before then everybody was from their native land. They were identified as, you know, if you were from Nigeria, you're from Nigeria. From Angola, you're from Angola. Right. Not that they right. had these names back then, but I'm just saying. Right. So right. But they, they, they call, they call. right. It wasn't until you start having slave raids on the plantations up here, with, along with indentured servants from Ireland up in the northern plantations in which they started they say you know uh they talked they they uh made a partnership with the irish that if you partner with us we'll give you the police force and we'll make you a member of this thing called you know the white community and by large by creating the white community you create the black community and that's pretty much when the idea of identifying all black people from africa as one solid mass of black people came into fray you even see it today you go through different parts of Philadelphia, you know what part of Philadelphia the <coughs> Irish live in because they got their flags out there. You know what parts the Italians occupy because they got their flags out there. You know the Jewish community because they got their flags with the big ass star out there. You know um, all these different communities, the Russian community, you know their community because shit, everything in, in the community is owned by them. So, um, and they learned how to separate because they were able to maintain their homogeneous history going back to their motherland. We can't really do that for the most part. Most of us can't identify past the uh, Civil War with who we're from and what, we're, and what they're part of. So that alone and, and put into this pressure pot yeah. of what you call America has put nobody in the history of the world has been under the undue pressure that black people have been and in such a situation where our extermination, we're on the brink of extermination every single day. And, and that type of pressure, and, and, and I think Patrick spoke to this earlier, when you have a culture that doesn't have time to sit down and read a damn book because you got to spend so much time, time to, trying to figure out how to survive, man, and that shit will drive you crazy. You're going to be great. And then we're expecting those same people. I mean, look at how the last days of Malcolm X were. Look at how he was flustered. He was doing press conferences in house coats. Look at Martin Luther King, surrounded by his enemies. He could barely sleep at night. And these are people who we still look to look at 60 years later as iconic thought. Well, you don't like the term thought leaders, but at the time, they were the thinkers. They were the ones leading the masses. They they were the ones galvanizing, organizing the the people to move in a particular direction. So, right. so, yeah. so you look at all the undue pressure into them. They didn't even have the surveillance grid up that we have right now. We can't say certain things on this particular platform because YouTube will spank us. And this is one of the biggest ways we can get to our people. And when we try to build it with our people, our people don't trust well, it. Well, <laughs> so so let's get to this. Pat, bring you back in here. Dr. Clark talked about the Hollywood mind. I'm going to call it the good guy versus bad guy syndrome. When you have, uh, like, example, he used W.E.B. Du Bois versus uh, uh, Russ Worm. Um, and the idea of um uh, he also talked about um um frederick du yeah Fre frederick excuse me frederick douglas versus russ worm uh, frederick douglas talking about we our blood sweat and tears are here in this country black people should stay in america and claim my part of america while russ worm and his contingent was saying let's go back to africa let's go build Let's let's go show that we can uh, once again build a nation. So let's get into this this good guy versus bad guy syndrome, this mindset that we have, and try to try to break this thing down further. Like, what are your what what's your breakdown of your analysis on this mindset that we have, this Hollywood mindset, or this good guy bad guy syndrome? Um, I think it's relevant, and I think is is what. So this is what we get back to. Like, if we had. A, a proper contingent of critical thinkers and thought leaders put in that information, we can analyze this from all sides and really see the detriment that it has. Uh, 
in every society, you're gonna have people that run towards and run run away. You got those people that agree with something and those people that you know are contrarian for the sake of being contrarian. They're gonna try to get as far away from it as possible. Uh, and understanding how these two groups operate becomes real interesting in a space where you're talking about good guy, bad guy mentality. Um, because nobody's really looking at people stop at that point looking at the merits of an argument based on the merits and the value of it. But it also has this weird space where people begin having a hard time viewing and honestly assessing things that are actually wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we have these spaces where it's like, okay, this person, these two people just have a difference of opinion, but both of their, views could work it's just a different approach and people will see that and they'll vilify one and deify the other and then when you have a situation that comes up where somebody is legitimately wrong like and i'm not talking about wrong from a philosophical standpoint i'm talking about wrong from a standpoint that like this person is actually doing something that is wrong they're molesting kids. They're this, they're that. They're doing things that are clearly wrong. Yeah, these same people in my mind with this same mentality doing the exact same thing. Well, that's just the way you see it. Let's look at it this way. Let, no, that, that, there's no other way. So it, it becomes a place where now not only are we not allowed or not able to view people in the light of the merits of their yeah. arguments and objectivity, but we become divided at this point over not just the good things that we should be unified over, but even the bad things that we should be unified over. And I think that's where it gets to be real interesting because we bring up the Du Bois and the Garvey argument frequently and the other people, those arguments uh, frequently about who was right and who was wrong. And it's like, that's not even a, a, a debate where right and wrong should be used. But then when we have serious cases um, like Umar Johnson, right versus wrong, all of a sudden we don't want to have that discussion either because I, I think it's all linked. I'm in the interest of keeping it brief. But I think it's all linked. And I think there's a, a clear... Uh, situation there where a lack of critical thinking in one area has negatively impacted us in every other area and that's where I said if we had a think tank doing what it needed to do and a community action team that's doing what it needed to do these are things that we could get out in front of and head off at the pass and remind people no we need to take this stance in this situation so that these things over here don't become a detriment yeah Yep, when you lack code and structure, you're vulnerable. So I, I think a great example of especially black people in America, black America buying into the good guy versus bad guy syndrome is um our view of the of the Republican Party versus the Democratic Party. Uh, <laughs> the majority of black people literally believe that the it's almost like the Republican Party are the are the demon spawns and the democratic party are our saviors and it's like you say it, it's a lack of a, of an ability to be objective about the information that's placed on the table because everybody knows that most black people are going to vote democrat anyway just because like the the platform of the person can be trash like we have evidence of not only like because we like to talk about it with the trump voters but we have a lot of evidence of black people voting against their own interest just because the person is viewed as the good guy. So that the good guy versus bad guy syndrome really hurts us bad. So PC, give us your thoughts on this syndrome and and, and how you think it further uh, impedes our progress. Well, I think a lot of us, well, what do I say there? Because I, I, I agree with what Pat said. I think a lot of us just don't have the, we don't have the ability to stand on our square. Mm -hmm. 
because they're too concerned of the pushback. And we've seen it. We've seen the, the pushback. I, you know, you speak about the Democrats and the Republicans. You know, you know, I work on the college campus, which is like a primary recruiting ground for, yeah. Uh, yeah. especially in Philadelphia, for Democratic voters. So during the last election period, when they were trying to get people to register, I kept saying, listen, I'm, I'm an independent. I'm not in one party or another. Brothers, it was a brother in particular, huffed and puffed like he was ready to fight me because I told him I was an independent and I wasn't, you know, interested in signing to the Democratic Party. Uh, I think black people love, like, it's like a child. Like, I keep saying we function from a place of, you know, arrested development. We function from the place of children. And it's funny because going back the last two, three hundred years, you know, these great white thinkers, right? These so-called great white thinkers have identified black people as being the children of the world. And in fact, that was one of the things that was just that made it justifiable for us to be enslaved in the first place. That we were children out in the wilderness. Um, and I think that being in a nanny state in a place where black people have, have 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 never really had a chance to be autonomy. We had maybe a 20, a 15, 20 year period where black people can actually build their own stuff here in America. And we know it from the way it was torn down in the early 1900s. So black people have always been dependent. When you're a dependent, it's like a child. It's like being in a child's place. And so now we're more concerned about being fans. Fans of who wins, the winner here, the winner there. We don't, we don't have the capacity, uh, unfortunately, to sit back, utilize critical thinking, as was said earlier, and to to take the pieces that work from both from both arguments. Take take if we're going to have a debate, the debate is not about who is the better orator, who's more skilled in defending their argument. The debate should be about a compilation of all these different things that the black community can use to go forward, move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to do that. We want to declare a winner. And everybody wants to choose to be on the side of the winner. Ego. And, and, and when you're not on the side of the winner, it spews you're good for you. And hate it, but it, it also goes back to the tribalism of us not being able to get along. You know, it was funny because growing up, I was always asked, and this was something that was put to me as a student all through elementary school, junior high school, high school, and college. Who do you think, who, 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 who do you support, Malcolm X or Martin Luther King? Right, right. And Malcolm right. X was always portrayed as the villain. Right. He right. was always portrayed as the bad guy. It wasn't until I did my own research on Malcolm X and learned who he truly was for me to 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 see him in the exalted state that I see him in as a thinker and, a, and as a man of the people. And it wasn't until and I actually started to have resentment for Martin Luther King until I got to study who he was. Mm hmm. Boy, hey, look, 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 and not to cut you off, but I was just about to say that when I had to do that breakdown on Dr. King's uh, speech for uh, Swagger Magazine, but doing that breakdown gave me a better understanding of Dr. King and his position, especially his position on nonviolence, but um, his view of the world and, and, and the angle he was taking to help the black community. And I think it's in alignment with our conversation. It wasn't necessarily a, a, a situation of Malcolm was better or Martin was better we were blinded by the fame and we we were blinded by the celebrity and people had to choose people felt like they had to choose a side they couldn't see an answer in both they couldn't see two things being uh val valuable at the same time and and don't forget about the fact that how how children respond to authority figures adults respond similar to adult to to uh to authority figures so when your authority figure is painting Malcolm X to be the bad guy, pressuring you to be like we shall overcome for the sanitized version of Dr. King that they shoved down our throat. This was something that was put on us in child. This, this left the imprint. Now, 
we were fortunate enough to break away from those shackles and develop our own train of thought. But all the people that can't, all the people, you know, and this goes back again to what I say about the black church being the biggest enemy of the black community. And it's not that I think that anybody's worship, but God is the enemy. But the way the black church was created on these plantations, don't forget the majority of black churches in the north came from pastors that grew up in the south. They came up north and set up their own delegations up here. So they brought that same notion of the emotional riding that emotional roller coaster to, to get you to move on things. Once I get your spirits out now, you're in that suggestive mindset. I can tell you anything I need you to tell and only believe me because I am the voice of God. I'm the vessel that God chose to yep. tell you to do yep. these things. Yep, that's how the, that's how the celebrity is created the charisma. Now look at all of the different leaders since then, all the different different speed how they played on emotional heartstrings. It ain't even just black leaders doing it. Donald Trump did it and got elected. You know what I'm saying? And he didn't care about none of those politics. If you know the history of Donald Trump, he hated the Republican Party. So when you think about how that works. And then how, when, as a people, if you're already in that suggestive mindset and it, it becomes complicity, um, complicit bias after a while, you, you're already thinking that way. You want to believe it. And then I'm going to create a situation where I'm going to feed you spiritually so you believe it. And now we hate, Mark, we hate Malcolm X. We love Dr. King because Dr. King said, Black children and white children will walk hand in hand. And, and we were supposed to dive into that message, not knowing that at the particular time, black girls were getting blown up in churches in Birmingham. Black children were getting stoned because they wanted to go to school because their parents forced them to go to school with white people. You ain't hear no story about black, uh, white children getting busted in the black schools right. and eating the National Guard for that. So, so we. I can go on, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay my point yeah, in. Yeah, nah, but but so so Pat, two things can be true at the same time. That's your saying. So looking at looking at the uh, conflicting ideas of Douglas versus Russ Warren, but also the, to me the biggest one is the boys versus Washington. I think, mm -hmm. and, and from my uh, vantage point, I think that's like the biggest um, debate or conflict between the intellectuals uh, within Black America. Because, you know, that's the question. I know that's the question I was always asked coming up is, well, who you agree with, the boys of Washington? And, you know, I used to always say, well, both of them. I mean, I, I, once, I, once, I, once I took the time and really sat down and read what, both of their positions and what they're presenting, I was like, well, I see value in both. I see value in having an educated class. I see value in having a skilled class. Why wouldn't we combine both? Because, like, like like Pat, like you're doing with your with your boys, like making sure they get the intellectual um they make sure they build themselves intellectually, but also make sure they have a skill, a trade that they can use. Why not combine both things? But Pat, like two things can be true at the same time. Why we got a problem with that? I think that's right back to what I think it's something we we keep hitting on. Uh and I think Chan this is why Chancellor Williams said black intellectuals and thought leaders, you got to spoon feed your information. Because here's the thing, like, if you're not being actively conditioned, and this is another one of those, like, think tank type situations, right? If you're not being actively conditioned in your house by your parents or by... <laughs> your community to think critically about life, then you don't know how to do it. American society is not, it's the same thing we say about racism. It doesn't matter what color or culture you're in. If your culture did not preach uh, consciously and purposefully black love, you don't like black people. Because that's the natural, that's what's in the air. Ignorance is American culture. Our 
movies. Everybody loves the Marvel movies. I think everybody mm-hmm. loves them because it's not deep. It's pure action. Good guys, bad guys. Good guys go fuck up bad guys. That's that's the plot for every Marvel movie, right? For every Hollywood action movie, that's the plot. Good guys go beat up bad guys. And we're ingrained into it as a little kid. You think about the cartoons we used to watch, the Looney Tunes, right? Sylvester was the bad guy. Tweety was yep. the good guy. At no yep. point in time did nobody ever sit back and say, well, I wonder why the cat is trying to eat the bird in every episode. That was never talked about. The fact that this in this animal's nature. To eat the bird. To eat the bird. That, That's what they do. To, to And the fact that the bird, because the bird is the good guy, the bird is allowed to vilify, mistreat, brutalize, and abuse the cat simply because the cat is following its nature. We don't think about, though, it's like, it, and then we grow up and we have people saying, well, this, like, we talk about female circumcision since we're pissing people off, right? <laughs> people are saying, like, those cultures that do that are animalistic, they're barbarians, they're horrible cultures that need to be destroyed. Well, that's how you feel, but that's not, that might not be what they think. Well, it don't matter what they think. I think it, like that starts, again, we we talk about how things are connected, right? Superiority complex. That's Tweety Bird and Sylvester manifested in the mind of an adult thinking about a complex issue. (laughs) So I think when Dr. Clark talks about our Hollywood minds and how we're groom that if there's a good guy there must be a bad guy and if there's a bad guy there must be a good guy and the movies that we hate you know i was just doing a a paper on this not too long ago the movies that most people tend to dislike don't have a clear good or bad they operate in that gray area where everybody's gray but even in operating in the gray, those movies aren't truly celebrated either unless it's clearly defined that everybody's gray. It has the to be put journey. right in your face, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody is that. great. Like everybody in this movie was good and bad. So it was a great movie. Yeah, because it was clearly defined for you. The moment you take the 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 moment you put all that in abstract and you put it in front of us as American people. We get fucked up. So I think it's just the grooming. It's, it's another one of them things where if black people are serious about life, then we got to understand that we have to raise our children differently. Yeah. We, we've we been conditioned to seek the hero. And like you say, if if I'm constantly seeking a hero, that's because a villain exists. In my mind, a villain exists. And it, and. In this case, and what we're talking about, the unfortunate part for us is the hero is one thinker and the villain is another thinker. And we can't see the forest for the trees because it's either I'm team Du Bois or I'm team Booker T. Washington. And because I'm team Booker T. Washington, I can't I can't even fathom or understand what's going on on the side of the boys and vice versa. If I'm on the boys, I can't even fathom and understand what's going on with Booker T. Washington. You're right. I'm, I'm right. You're wrong. You're wrong. I'm right. And it's like, there has to be a winner. There has to have, there has to be somebody who's triumphant over the other, because if that's not the case, then we don't have our hero. Because that's the only way we can have a hero because that comes from the conditioning that we've had over the years. So that that good guy, bad guy syndrome. But like that was something I that was that, that was excellent for Dr. Clark to point that out. Like that was that was brilliant. Yeah, the programming is real. And that's why, you know, when that word is thrown around, we just dismiss it because we don't understand what it means. Like, no, nah, it's not television program, the television is programming us. But not only does programming is the television programming us the agenda is programming us we're socially engineered to function in certain ways and this this uh this, this good guy bad bad guy thing that we're talking about i mean look at you know uh 
I, I used to teach a class called the Art of History, well, um, the History of Art, and um, and one of the things that uh, that that we talked about was sort of like the transition from uh, the satire comics that were put, the political comics that were put in, in newspapers, because the majority of America and the majority of the world was illiterate at that particular time. So this is how you illustrated a particular viewpoint. And this is how you were able to create stereotypes. And that was what was used. One of the biggest driving points of white supremacy was to create the animalistic tactic, nature of black men in particular. Drawing black men as werewolves, drawing black men as gorillas who were, you know, snatching white women off the plantations and or snatching white women off the streets and running into the woods and and, and doing horrible things to them. That was the um, that was one of the things that was created from that. Then you go forward and you go and see how it's done in film. And we learned how uh, black spirituality to this day is demonized because the first motion pictures in America that started the good guy, bad guy, because they, they used to use it as God versus the devil. And so they would align black spirituality, specifically the, the spiritual system of voodoo mm -hmm. with, 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 with being in league with the devil and therefore you be turned into zombies. And it's funny because I was just watching an episode of Jerry Seinfeld um, the other, last night, as a matter of fact. And one of the episodes came on where this elder white man was talking about the fact that he had this Haitian sister who was working as his caretaker in the home. He didn't speak any English. And all he kept talking about is she was trying to get me to turn into a zombie playing her voodoo music. But it ain't going to work, you know. But this is something that's, you know, uh, black people have also said about uh, this. And we're, we're programmed to see that African spirituality is in league with some darkness. Meanwhile, praising the same white spirituality that held us in bondage, which but, is one of but, the craziest but, things. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But, 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 but missing the parallels that exist between voodoo and Christianity. They have parallels. Right. Like one wasn't, in fact, well, we're not going to get into the history of it, but one is, is part of the other tree. And it ain't voodoo. <laughs> right. So, um, and, but and it's funny because, and Pat is a genius when it comes to some of this stuff he says. I'll be just sitting there blown away sometimes. But when you think about um, the cartoons, Stan Lee created the X-Men based on the di the, the, the dichotomy of Malcolm X and Martin Luther yeah. King. Yeah. And so everybody watching it thought Magneto was the bad guy. Not realizing we were all suffering from Xavier Sin. I bruh, bruh. I used to love these <laughs> debates. I, I love that. 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 I, for those of you who don't get it, you just don't get it. But but no, but I, I love that because <laughs> I remember having the debates of was Magneto really the villain? Because Magneto was looked at as the villain by, by the humans and Magneto didn't take the same path as Charles Xavier because um, if they would have, if, if, if Xavier and Magneto would have combined ideas, the mutants would have had no issues with the humans. Not. Well, here's the thing. They started off as partners. Right? right. In addition to that, you know, uh, and, and, and this is something else, too. Now, and this is just a little sidebar. If you really think about that comic strip, the, the X-Men, if Xavier, if, if Professor Xavier and uh, <clears throat> Magneto were Dr. King and Malcolm yeah. X, that means the rest of the X-Men were black. Exactly. The mutants, the, period. The mutants, the, period, were black. The evolutionary superior race on the planet was black. And their, their push for extermination of the evolutionary race was to design an AI computer that was smarter than everything that <laughs> took out all of humanity. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> that's, but, but My that's why. That's why. always talk about coming out. But that's why you have to clone Tyrone so you can make as many right. niggas as possible so you won't have any Mac no more Magnetos out here. But 
the the interesting part about that is that um the problem with the X-Men for instance wasn't Magneto right it Magneto was, was perfectly fine and able and willing he saw benefit in Charles doing what Charles was doing the problem was Charles yep mm -hmm. and that's again what we run into the problem you know when to put this in terms of the people that don't understand it since we put them in terms of Magneto and, and uh, uh Malcolm and Martin in this particular case, the problem was not Malcolm. The problem was that Martin wouldn't leave Malcolm alone to do what Malcolm felt he needed to do for the people that agreed with him and also wanted to do what he wanted to do. Like Magneto wasn't trying to conquer the world. He just wanted a safe spot for his people. That's it. Charles, at every opportunity, Wanted to integrate, <laughs> right? Wanted to, wanted, to, wanted to assimilate with the humans, right? Like even, even, and I know some people that are hardcore with the comments would be like, "Yeah, but Magneto was doing some crazy shit to get what he wanted." Well, yeah, but even in the moments when Magneto found an isolated place just for him and his people, Charles still found some way to show up and fuck with him. <laughs> 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 so I, to me that's always the trippy part because it's also it you, we go back to how we connect the dots right anybody anywhere in the world that disagrees with you needs to be stopped right that's right. the mentality well well i remember you and i Pat, having a conversation and we were talking about uh a lot of the youth it's been so ingrained into them. This this opposition mindset has been so ingrained into them. You know, we've we both had conversations with youth who believe that if they if they disagree with their friends, then they can no longer be friends because they must agree on every single thing. And that's not how humans exist. You're going to have disagreements. There are going to be some things that we don't see eye to eye on, but that don't mean that you're wrong, and that don't mean that I'm wrong. Now there are some are going to be times where wrong and right does present itself but that doesn't mean that because i disagree with you or because i see the world differently or because i think we need to take a different plan that i'm right and you're wrong or any vice versa it's like you like you said pc earlier when we were talking about the, the purpose of the debates the purpose of the debates should be to come up with the best plan of action rather than who's the who's more intellectually superior and when you stuck on trying to uh get trying to gain intellectual dominance you see how we as a people continue to be stagnant or start to regress mm -hmm. i mean that that's what it is that's what it is. we have to get over the good guy bad guy syndrome and start to really be able to see the world from an objective point of view that, that's that's on us right there like, yes, white people create the problem, but we got to fix it. Yeah. Um, and and that has to be it. And I think sometimes, too, with this, we have to be strong enough to allow people who want to just exist, mm -hmm. allow people who just want to be, to be on their own, while those of us who want to solve problems those of us who want to build go over into our own place in the world and build y'all just can't suffer from xavier syndrome once y'all see us building some shit and wanting to come jump on board break down xavier syndrome for him real quick <laughs> i know we i know we said it but make just make it clear so basically uh and listen y'all do far better because y'all the ones that came up with the term i just happened to be there when y'all did it <laughs> Yeah, I think Pat yeah. came up with Xavier. I did JRS. Yeah, yeah JRS. <laughs> we, you know what? I think you know what? No, no, no. Let's save that for another show. Let's no, JRS. Save. Yeah, that's a whole breakdown by itself. Yeah, JRS syndrome, yeah. Xavier syndrome. Because I think that. So basically, I think Pat explained Xavier syndrome earlier. 
you know, right. when he spoke right. about the fact that uh, wanting to be, um, wanting, basically wanting to uh, coalesce or become part of the, the, the bigger society. In other words, basically um, becoming a traitor to your people. You know, um, but like I said, y'all can do much better because I, I, I know it well enough to talk about it. I'm not sure I know it well enough to teach it, but I know it well no, enough to, to, to engage in the conversation. We, no, we, we, we'll say that for a whole breakdown when we when we give y'all, um, you know, what Jackie Robinson, JRS is Jackie Robinson syndrome, give you that and uh, Xavier syndrome why we came up with these, what they mean and how they apply to us as black people, not just in America, but across the world, because it goes into this uh, psychological conditioning that has happened to black people throughout the centuries, you know, since white contacts. So um, th these are, these are, these are things, ideas, thoughts and stuff that conversations that we've had for years and we've been able to build and build and build upon these. Like we say, these, these breakdowns are an extension of our regular conversations. So we just put some structure to it and we want to make sure that we're all thinking it's these remember these are for us to check ourselves for everybody to check ourselves it's not it's not us preaching at you it's we're talking to ourselves too but we're just giving this information and if it helps it helps if it doesn't i don't know but we we hope it helps but these um these breakdowns they're gonna keep coming though they're gonna keep coming because these are our thoughts these are ideas and this is how we see the world and this is how we believe that we can make some changes to be able to make some progress and make a difference but we also encourage you to not to not just if you are a content creator don't just be a content creator get into your community and contribute in some way if you are a content consumer same thing you do don't just consume the content get in your community and consume in some way example <clears throat> my you know i took you know uh think about the nine areas of human activity i took education and sex hit black provide black history information and safe sex prevention information especially for black people so choose your path choose your lane and do your thing mm. so just one more thing so Xavier syndrome more as a, a mindset of an assimilation <laughs> that doesn't care about the welfare of their own people. So um I'm gonna leave it at there for I'm gonna leave it there for now. Yeah. Well that's that's all we got for y'all today, man. You know, super pat professor Carlton Jones, fetlifestation.com. Make sure y'all tune in. He be going, hey, he be going in. He be going in. So y'all make sure y'all check him out, support the homie. Uh thepaxinc.org make sure you support the platform support the site go ahead check out the codes of conduct that are there you know we're on the shoulders of giants uh on the shoulders one.com is the website you see it scrolling at the bottom make sure you support their links in the bio i mean excuse me links in the description to support as well you can support me on patreon and everything like this video make sure y'all like and share and comment like share and comment let's get these views let's get these views we're almost to fifty thousand. let's get the fifty thousand so we can push the hundred thousand let's get these let's raise these views up on the video let's stop tripping let's get this information out and let's 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 move forward and get our stuff together so love y'all. Catch y'all next time.